Hi, everyone. Audio check, Richa. Dr. Green, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can. Perfect. Yeah. We can see you also. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can see you also. <laughs> I'll just give another minute. Maybe a few more folks can join, and then we can get started. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Are we good to start? Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everyone. We are grateful that you could join us today. Indo-US Chamber of Commerce of Northeast Florida welcomes you to the very first event organized by the new leadership team. It's a great honor for me to serve as the president of the chamber. I would first like to thank our immediate past president, Satya Chudamani, and immediate past board chair, Janak Desai, for their leadership past year. Our organization is entering into the 18th year. It has been a wonderful journey so far, only because of the support of our members, sponsors, speakers, and the volunteer service leadership team. It has been a great pleasure to put this event together during this COVID-19 crisis. So we wanted to address the immediate needs of the community. So we have put this event together. I would like to introduce the moderator for today's event, Richa Batra our very own VP and treasurer of the chamber. Richa Batra teaches in School of Computing Department in UNF. She has a teaching profession experience for almost 15 years. She has also taught in India and UK. She is married since 18, 13 years. Her husband works with Black Knights and is a proud mother of two boys, 11 years and eight years old. She is also a community leader. Let's welcome Richa Betra. Richa, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Amuda. Thank you so much for introducing me. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much, Jacksonville parents, for joining us for today's live session. And the session is Back to School Dilemma in Backdrop of Pandemic. Well, I myself, being the parent of two boys, as Amuda just told you, I know we have a lot of questions for the school year 2020-21, which is about to start very soon. So we at Indo-US Commerce, we decided to have this live session to help the parents to have almost all their queries answered before the school starts. And to be honest to you, when we think about the dual public schools, there is one person for sure who stands out and that is our superintendent, Dr. Diana Green, the superintendent of the dual county public schools. I'm so proud to share with you all that today, Dr. Diana Green is our key speaker. And I'm just going to give you a brief introduction about her. She began her tenure as superintendent of Dual County Public Schools, the 20th largest school district in the nation on July 1st, 2018. 
She arrived to this role with extensive classroom and leadership experience, beginning with her elementary teaching position at Mamie Agnes Jones in Baldwin, Florida. Prior to becoming superintendent in Duval County, she served as a superintendent and deputy superintendent of instructional services in Manatee County. During her 33 year career as an educator, she has spent time as a teacher, assistant principal and principal, as well as in curriculum development, staff development, and in senior executive leadership. Last summer, Dr. Green's initial assessment of dual county public schools concluded three major goals. Number one, to improve academic achievement to become an A-rated school district. Number two, to improve the safety. And finally, to bring financial solvency to the district. After just one year of leadership, the district has made outstanding progress on each goal. Yes, yes, we do have. Academics, safety, and financial solvency underlie one of the most visible initiatives of Dr. Green's first year as superintendent of Dual County, a proposed referendum to voluntarily impose a half penny sales tax to radically improve all school facilities over the next 10 to 15 years. If successful, the revenue will make schools safer, improve academic outcomes, and reduce operational cost, enabling more dollars to be spent in the classroom. On a personal note, Dr. Green is the daughter of a father who served in the Air Force, and she grew up living in the locations all over the United States and abroad. She is married to James Green, an independent financial advisor and retired Navy. They have two sons, Eldon and Joshua. Uh, Dr. Green, just a, like I'll say a few second story. When I got your bio, I was telling my husband about the important goals that you, and I'm sure like we did it because I was part some of some of the meetings. My younger son was sitting with me and he was like, oh, geez, she's a super woman. I say, yes, she sure is. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a new word for you. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so we welcome you, Dr. Green, and thank you so much for accepting to join us. This is the third time Indo US has requested you. And seriously, never ever you have said no. Being so busy every time, we give you a week before notice, and you're like, okay, these days I'm available, and these are the timings. So thank you so much for each you're and every welcome. time. So uh, I'm sure all the parents are obviously having many and a lot of questions, which of course we will ask them and we will reply them. Uh, before I start with the QA session, Dr. Green, do you want to say some few words? Well, first, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I always have a great time when I uh, spend time with you all and you always have great questions. Uh, as you know, today, or you may not know, today is the first day that teachers returned and other support employees returned uh, back to work. And um, we will implement our training program with our teachers as well as uh, training them on all the resources and strategies that we have in place at our schools, those that will be in brick and mortar, so that we are fully prepared for students that will attend in brick and mortar on August 20th, as well as those students who are attending through distance learning, that we are ready for August 20th uh, for those students. Oh, that's great. Uh, before we start with the QA, I have just a few things to all the parents who have joined us. Uh, we did just start it, and I will make sure to ask those questions. So do not worry that we have ignored you or something like that. So they will be answered. And also, if after the time, like whatever the time slot is there for this session, if something is there like we could not answer because of the time limit we will still take your questions we will put it in the form of faqs and of course we will reply as soon as we can so we will try our best that no questions are left unanswered so i start with the qa session and here comes the first question 
Okay, this is uh, Dr. Green. This is some a question which I guess some teachers. Uh, one of the parent is asking some teachers. So this is some teachers have expressed concern today that they began pre planning about the social distancing when they saw some of their colleagues not practicing six feet rule. How will the social distancing be implemented among the staff members? Yes, that is why it is a requirement that all employees and students, it will be mandated that they wear a facial covering. Uh, we added an additional support for teachers with face shields, but it is a requirement that they wear a facial covering because we know that there will be times that we cannot uh, have six feet social distancing. Uh, even in the midst of the new guidelines that, and I can't say guidelines, it was new information that came out from uh, the Pediatric Association that they are indicating the desk um, should now be uh, three feet. We still are trying to implement as much as we can six feet physical distancing, but that is why we are also mandating that employees, students are, are wearing uh, face masks at all times. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. And do we have any other question right now? Can all I right. add something the to that? My answer, can I add something to that? Yeah, sure. We do know that students and adults, when they go to lunch, because <laughs> I, I don't want to, anyone to mistake, of course, they will be able to remove their face mask when they are eating lunch or when they are drinking water. Uh, but the, the main requirement is that everyone should be wearing a facial covering. Oh, oh great. Okay, now I have a question. If a student refuses to wear a mask or practice, like refuses to practice a self distance, mm -hmm. what recourse should be taken? Well, first and foremost, uh, our, if they're riding a bus, uh, we have shared with parents, they are required to wear a face mask. If they uh, come to the bus stop and they don't have one, uh, all buses will be outfitted with additional face coverings. They will be given one. If a student refuses to wear one, a phone call will be made. Uh, the teacher should send them to the office. Phone call will be made with the parent. That conversation will be had, that it is mandatory, it is required. Uh, if that student is, is still, they will not go back to class until they are wearing a facial covering. Uh, we will continue to try not to make this punitive, but we do have several steps put in place to uh, work with families. And if they have a medical condition, then they need to have a, um, a sort of a doctor's note that explains that they can't wear a facial covering, then they will be offered a face shield. And if that is also an issue, then they need to have um, a medical doctor's note indicating that there is a specific reason why they cannot wear a facial covering or a face shield. Oh, I like this. This is a nice thing to be followed. My next question is, what are the criteria for deciding to close the schools when the virus undoubtedly spreads uncontrolled as it has throughout the rest of our nation? Yes, we currently have the Department of Health working with a medical advisory committee developing those guidelines and we know that they've completed what does it take to close the classroom and what does it take to close the school. We will be sharing that information with our school board and then that will be posted on our website and we will uh, get that message out to our families. This is the criteria that um, would be, uh, that would have to be met for us to close a classroom or close a school. Oh, okay. So that's fine. The next question is, if someone in class gets positive for COVID-19, will we be notified who in the class is basically notified? Um, COVID-19 really is not different than any other communicable disease 
that we always notify families if they have the ability to be impacted by uh, whatever that disease, and today we're talking about COVID-19. Um, we will notify families that uh, of students that may have been engaged or had prolonged exposure to someone that has positive COVID-19. Of course, we have to do it in a way that we follow the guidelines of HIPAA and um, protect the privacy of the individual that may have that tested positive, but at the same time notify those families of students that may have had prolonged exposure. That letter will tell them what next steps they need to take and um, give them the information up front. Oh, okay. Uh, the next question is, my son is enrolled in dual homeroom. I'm told he can participate in baseball, but not in the baseball class. Why is this? And will virtual electives be weighted more than the on-site electives like gym, et cetera? Um, yes, your child can participate in after-school activities, but if you have chosen to enroll in Duval Homeroom, you've signed up for all of your classes to be through distance learning. So no, they cannot come and take a, a class on campus if you have signed up because that is a full-time distance learning model. But we are not stopping any students from participating in after-school activities. So the baseball team, if they are trying out for the baseball team, they can still participate. Um, no classes are weighted more. Um, I, I'm hoping I'm understanding. If you're taking an elective that is weighted at brick and mortar, then that, and it's the same elective, it's weighted through Duval Home Rome. If you're taking an elective that is not weighted, it's not weighted on Duval Home Rome, nor is it weighted at brick and mortar. I hope I'm, I'm answering that question. I hope I'm addressing the question that they're trying to ask. Oh, we weighted more than one outside the electives. I think so, yes. Uh, now, the next question, Dr. Green, I have is, Will there be a testing initiative for the teachers and administrators? If we're talking about COVID-19 testing. Yes, the COVID-19 testing. Yes, rapid yes. testing, yes. We are starting an initiative for rapid testing for employees, all employees that um, are um, hired by DCPS. Oh, okay. That's great. And the... Here comes the next question. The desk shields are made of cardboard and will not hold up to repeated cleanings. How are replacements funded? Well, first and foremost, the desk shields are sprayed with an antimicrobial uh, spray that uh, doesn't need to be cleaned except once every 90 days. So we are going to do it once every 45 days. And so those desk shields, they do not need to continue to wipe down the, the desk shields. Um, we felt that the foam and film were more appropriate because um, they're easily, you can easily replace them. The plexiglass, uh, if they hit the ground, they were more likely to crack and break into sharp pieces. And we did not want that um, as, a, a, as another issue to be concerned about broken plexiglass. And, and so that's why we went with the foam and film. And our goal is that we, that we work with students to ensure that this is there for their protection as well as the protection of their teachers and other employees working at the school and that it's very important that whatever the directions that are being given in their classroom that they need to follow those directions. The, another question I have is, why have you decided to force dual home teachers to teach from a school room and not remotely if they are at high risk? Um, we have not forced teachers who are teaching full-time Duval homeroom to teach from school. 
uh, they can teach remotely if they are teaching full time. If the question relates to our teachers who are teaching hybrid, where some days students are at school and other days they're teaching at Duval Homeroom, it is correct that those teachers would be at the school. Oh, okay. So I, I, I see that my computer is saying that um, it's thundering where I am and there seems to be a problem with my camera. So oh, I hope okay. That's fine. Me. Yes. I will. Okay. Yes, yes, of course we can. Okay. It's like, obviously, when we see your face, we are more happy, but that's okay. <laughs> can hear you. <laughs> okay, now here the next question is, oh, that is a nice question. Will there be a video orientation for upcoming sixth graders on dual homeroom for how to navigate through the teams on bell schedules? Um, there will be an orientation for our Duval homeroom students, regardless of sixth grade level. Uh, and when they are in class, the it will be pretty simple as, well, I say simple, it will be very similar to being in brick and mortar. So at the end of the class, the, the teacher will say, hey, your next class period starts at such and such time or will start in five minutes and so make sure you do your class on time. But there will be support for, for our students who are participating through Duval Homeroom. Oh, okay. That is really good because my son is also going to sixth grade. So that was a nice question. Uh, Dr. Green, I have a question from one of the parents who was asked before. Uh, if one of the students, like the parents opt just an example for the face-to-face -face class, but after two or three weeks, they are feeling, no, they are not comfortable because like the child is not agreeing to wear the mask or something. Can they move to the dual homeroom or will they have to wait for nine weeks? Or even if it is reversed, like homeroom, but we are not satisfied with the homeroom. We want to go back to the school. Do we have to wait for nine weeks or we can move in between? Students, if a family starts off in brick and mortar and for some reason they should want to choose to go to Duval homeroom, they can. They need to contact their school administration. Uh, okay. And we do ask that you commit for nine weeks. Uh, okay. If parents are currently in Duval homeroom, we have elected for the one time, I think it's when we, uh, through our plan, we are hybrid until September 14th. And at that time, we will allow families, if you're in Duval homeroom you can, and you want to come back to brick and mortar, you can, but if they, do not come during that window. We ask that they stay with their selection until the end of the nine weeks. They will get a letter about a few weeks before the end of the nine weeks to ask them, do you want to transition back to brick and mortar? And okay. if they do, then schools have time to prepare uh, to make that transition. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Now, the next question is, Schools do not fall under HIPAA guidelines unless they provide healthcare services. Why cannot contact tracing be performed when students and teachers start to become sick as they might be? Uh, no doubt the question says absolutely well. But well, yes. well, schools do fall under HIPAA. We do have to follow HIPAA guidelines because we do provide healthcare services. We have nurses, we, we have uh, individuals who administer medicine, uh, so we do fall under those guidelines, but we do have a team that will be doing contact tracing and will be providing notification to individuals that may have had prolonged exposure. But again, we do have to protect the privacy of the individual uh, who tested positive. Oh, okay. That is good. Thank you. And now the next question is, will there be classes available to teach parents how to use the dual homeroom? I know that there is an orientation. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure. It's one delineated for parents versus one for students. But I know that um, that was something that came out of Duval Homeroom during the spring, mm -hmm. uh, that parents needed support. And so I, 
I know that they are working on that orientation to help parents with Duval Home Oh, okay. Uh, the next question is, my daughter is a high school senior for the year 2021. She has an elective of hope. Is there any way she can do it in dual homeroom? Okay, I hope I'm understanding the question. Um, hope is not an elective. It is a requirement, a hope class. That is like a oh. physical education class. It's not an elective, it's a requirement. So it should be offered through uh, Duval Home Room. Oh, I, okay. I, I just don't know enough about the partic particular school. Uh, so I would recommend that you contact your guidance counselor to ensure that if your child is taking Duval home room full. And so that's why I'm a little confused about the question. If they're enrolled in Duval home room and that is a, a course that is, re, which it is required, uh, it should be scheduled and they should be able to take it through Duval home room. Oh, okay. I, I, I'm hoping I'm understanding the question. Uh, I guess I was just about to say the parent, like as Dr. Green said, just email the school. But if you think you're not getting the response or something, or there was some like something different you wanted to ask, just let us know. And then, of course, we will contact again the dual county and we'll go get back to you. OK, uh, the next question is, will elementary students be able to drop off supplies and virtually meet their teachers, I guess, before we start school? I know that many of the schools are doing virtual orientations and yes. it really depends on your school. You should be receiving information soon. Uh, there will be a series of call outs starting probably in the next day or two so that families will be getting messages from the district. They'll get messages from me, sort of like here are the top five things you need to know whether you're doing Duval homeroom or you're coming back in brick and mortar. But I know that each school, um, many schools have already started their or their virtual orientations. Yes, we did receive the email from our school. Yes, so they have. Uh, the next question is, will students be required to sign in at certain times for instruction or will the instruction be recorded and available anytime? I guess she's asking when the, they're going to be in the class. If, 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 if your student is enrolled in Duval Home Room, instru instruction will be at certain times. If your student is enrolled in Duval Virtual Instructional Academy, that is our virtual school, that is what we call asynchronization. That means they can get their instruction at any time during the day. But mm -hmm. Duval Home Room, is synchronized instruction, meaning it follows on the same bell schedule and time as if they were in brick and mortar. So if high school starts at 7.15 a.m. Uh, first period, then on Duval Homeroom, your your high school Duval Homeroom starts at 7.15 a.m. as well. Oh, okay. So it's same as you're saying face-to-face. -face. It's just like yeah. that, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Here comes the next question. My son is transferring from out of state and I was informed we could be part of the school choice program, but I am being instructed to get a special assignment for him. What is the process I need to do since the form will not come up on the focus? Well, since I don't know what school this, I can help them best by them emailing me this information so that I can get it to the right person to support them. So my oh. email address is green D G R E E N E D at duvalschools.org. And Haley, I trust me, you will email her and you will get the reply. I am the evidence yeah. for this. It's not like she's just saying it because she's Facebook live, right? So she will do it. And you receive uh, like very quickly, if, which you will not even think of. So yes, make sure you do that. The next is why are parents not given an opportunity to continue with a hybrid model by having their students attend some classes at brick and mortar and other classes through, I guess, the dual homeroom. This would work well 
for block schedules, A and B days? Our hybrid model for high schools is is one that students only attend school two days a week and they are on Duval homegrown three of those days. Uh, I really believe that it really depends on the classes. So I truly can't answer this question. Again, it would need to contact your guidance counselor. We have students all the time take a virtual class from Florida virtual. It doesn't mean that they still can't attend our hybrid model. I'm just not sure how how they're trying to schedule their classes. Oh, okay. The next question is, what are the procedures for school buses? Uh, currently, we are requesting that families register for their school bus, that they would go to our website uh, and just click, you'll see uh, back to school, click on that and look for transportation and register your child's bus stop. The reason we are asking families to register is so that we know how many students would be at in, any given bus stop. Uh, but if you have already registered, First of all, your child needs to have a facial covering, a face mask on at the bus stop. We ask students to social distance six feet apart, if at all possible. Once they enter the bus, they need to have a facial covering on. If they don't, the bus driver will give them one. They have to uh, put hand san they have to clean their hands with hand sanitizer. We will start in rolling on the bus from the back. And, and work the way to the front. Uh, when they disembark the bus, they have to hit, uh, clean their hands again with hand sanitizer, and then they would exit the bus. After the bus completes its route, the bus will go through and disinfect the bus before they go to the next route. And the same process works for the next group of students that would enter that bus. And when that bus is done with that route, um, before they pick up middle school students, then they would have to um, sanitize the bus again. So that's, that's the um, basic procedures. I hope I'm understanding the question. Yes, I guess that was the main thing to ask. Mm -hmm. Uh, before I read this question, I have one question from the parent and Danya, I will surely get back to your question also. Are the schools, uh, like in each classroom, there will be a sanitizer. Am I correct, Dr. Green? Yes, there will be hand sanitizer in each classroom. And how will the, like, teachers be sure that the students are using and after how many minutes or like classes, they are going to use that sanitizer or they are checking that kids are washing their hands? Um, the, the school, each school is supposed to set up a uh, hand washing schedule, especially at elementary. Um, every, we recommend every class that when students enter that they do hand sanitizer and uh, when they leave, it's optional about when they leave because the very next class that they're going to, they should do hand sanitizer. Oh, we okay. also recommend after students go, especially elementary, out to recess or PE, that they actually wash their hands. Um, one, it's a little hard to remove dirt. Hand sanitizer is about killing bacteria, and we, we just want them to wash their hands as frequently. Okay, thank you. The next question, oh, uh, can I have that question back, the one which I had from Diana? I didn't read that question. Okay, the next question is, is recess available for kindergarten students? Uh, recess is available for all elementary students. Oh, okay. It, it, recess is, requ we're required to do um, 20 minutes of recess each day. Okay, I have that question back. Now, the question is, what is the reasoning behind transitioning for five days per week on September 14? Why not carry out the hybrid option for the whole year? 
The reason that there there is a deadline of September 14th is because there was an executive order given by the governor that schools were to open their doors five days a week. We submitted a waiver for opening that uh, included this hybrid model and we had to give a deadline when would transition to five days a week. In September, you might ask, well, what's special about September 14th? Uh, it actually, in the original plan, was for the day after Labor Day. But in the original plan, school was going to start August 10th. And because we pushed the date of August of August 10th to August 20th as the new date, we simply pushed our timeline by the same number of days. And so that's why it's September 14th. Uh, oh, okay. We are working with our Department of Health and, and medical advisors to, to put a mechanism in place for um, sort of a decision-making make, metric that would say, well, based on um, our data in our schools, we believe we need to continue on the hybrid model for X amount of time. Uh, we had to get this approved by the Department of Education to uh, be able to offer this hybrid model without offering five days a week for everyone at every level. Our plan has elementary coming to school five days a week. Middle school is on hybrid. Sixth grade goes to school four days a week. Seventh and eighth grade, three days a week. And then high school, two days a week. And the reason we felt the hybrid was a the best option was that it limited the number of students on campus. Um, when you have a high school the size of Sandalwood, you know, close to 3,000 students, that's a lot of student movement. It's very difficult to do social distancing. It would be almost virtually um, impossible to uh, run the lunches in the cafeteria, very fortunate that our administrators have been very creative. We will be, we will probably have lunch in the cafeteria, outdoors, in other areas of the school so that schools can uh, implement social distance. So we will continue to work with the Department of Education if we still believe that the hybrid needs to continue after September 14th, we will need our Department of Health and, and evidence to explain why we're requesting it. Oh, okay. The next question is, will the school year calendar shift to the right if COVID becomes significantly worse and schools have to close down for a few days? Um, if I understand this correctly, the calendar will not shift because if we have to close a classroom or we close a school, those students will immediately shift to Duval Home Room. That is why we're training all teachers uh, with, on Duval Home Room. In the event we had to close a school, the student would immediately go to Duval Home Room so that the calendar is not impacted. Oh, okay. Next question is, what is being done for those schools that have a low dual homeroom number? Are most teachers being hired so to keep class sizes under 22? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I was trying to, I didn't hear the question completely. Uh, we are working with those schools uh, we have very few schools that have low enrollment for Duval Homeroom, uh, but we still have a requirement for class size, and it really will depend on how many students we have in our district, and we will work through that process uh, up to the first 10 days of school. That's when we work on leveling classrooms, looking at the possibility of some issues, with certain schools. We will uh, look at that the first week of school, how many students are in Duval homeroom versus how many students are in brick and mortar. And when, you know, students can uh, 
decide that after they're in brick and mortar that they may want to move to Duval Homeroom. So it will be very fluid, especially those first 10 days of school. Oh, okay. The next question is, if a student has an IEP and that say, uh, IEP that says they are mainstreamed for resource classes, art, music, lunch, etc. Will they attend with the mainstream or will they remain in a self-contained class? Um, if a student has other classes outside of their main class, we are working so that they can participate in those other classes. Those are some things that for ESC students that are, are very important and our goal is to maintain their IEP as it is written. Oh, okay. Now the next question that I have is, if my child has a fever and isn't able to come back to brick and mortar school, does she go to home school even though she's not enrolled for that? Uh, no, this would be treated the same way as if your child was out sick for any other, for common cold, the flu, they, they will be able to make up their work. But we are asking if your child is sick, please, please, please keep them home. You can always uh, get them work and we can always make up the work. Oh, okay. uh, next question. For students doing full-time dual homeroom, do you recommend that they use their own laptops or they can get or like loan a DCPS laptop? I do recommend that if you have a laptop that you use your own laptop. Uh, many times you, the, this child is already familiar with their own laptop and they know how it works. But if they do not have a laptop, on that form, we requested that if you need a laptop to tell us on the enrollment form or if you needed uh, a hotspot for access, internet access on that form. If families did not mark yes that they needed, at this time, we're only supporting those families who mark yes, I need a laptop or yes, I need a hotspot. After school starts, once we have taken care of all those families, and let's just say your laptop breaks, then you contact um, your school and the school will work getting um, you a, a DCPS laptop. Oh, okay. The next question is, if an entire school or class has to be closed because of an outbreak, what is your plan to transition them to online? Uh, during the early weeks or the early part of the school year, we are working on this survey for all of our families. Do they have access to a laptop or do they have internet um, capability? Because if we have to transition the school or a class, they immediately go to the homeroom. It's already, Duval Homeroom is already set up in, in our system. So all you need is a laptop and internet and go to um, our website and click Duval Homeroom. They're already, all students are already enrolled. And so it is that, I don't want to say it's that simple, but it is that simple uh, that, that they would just immediately transition to Duval Homeroom. Oh, okay. Uh, the next question is, will special resource classes that apply to elementary magnet schools, for example, technology resource classes, be taught virtually through DHR, like dual homeroom, as they were in the spring? I no longer see this class on my cl uh, child's schedule. So dual homeroom students should not be penalized for choosing this option. Well, uh, I don't know what school this is, so uh, it, it, it would be hard for me to answer that question, um, that the, the technology resource class, why is it not offered? I can't really answer that because I don't know what school this is. Um, but for our elementary magnets, 
the the elective, the goal was to try to ensure that we could do all of the electives. However, we do have some challenges, especially when it comes to the secondary, which uh, was stated at the very beginning that electives would be limited. Uh, through Duval Homeroom, these teachers at the elementary are generally teaching uh, from their from their remote location and they're usually full time. The electives, some of those electives are also being offered brick and mortar. So some of the teachers are teaching brick and mortar and having to teach Duval Homeroom. But because I don't know which school this is, uh, it, it's very hard for me to answer that question. Uh, do you think if they email the principal or anything, they can know it or? Yes, I, I would try first emailing your principal to ask about the question. Um, the school may not be offering that course this upcoming school year. So that may be one of the reasons why it's not being offered in the homeroom. Like I said, I, I not knowing the school, it's hard for me to answer that question. Uh, the next question is, will parents be able to switch from homeroom oh, from homeroom to brick and mortar before the nine weeks is up? I guess we had this question before. Uh, uh, we are asking, when we started with the Duval homeroom, we asked parents to make a nine-week commitment. However, at September 14th, when... Um, we're supposed to ensure that all schools are five days a week at brick and mortar. We did make the decision that this could be an opportunity for parents if they want to from the Duval homeroom to go back to brick and mortar, that this would be the time to do it. But beyond that time, we're requesting that they um, not make uh, a switch until the end of the nine weeks, if that is their desire. Oh, okay. That is fine. Now, I, uh, the next question that I have is, if your child is on IEP at a magnet school, but enrolled in homeroom temporarily, would he go into the school for the IEP meetings or they are going to do those meetings also online until further notice? Uh, if, if your child needs an IEP meeting, some of them are done online and some of them are done in person. It really depends on how many people have to be present at that IEP meeting and can they implement social distancing. Uh, so I've been a part of some at school where it is face-to-face uh, -face because there's only three people who need to be there. And I've been a part of some that are done online because there are 15 people who have to be a part of that IEP meeting. Uh, but if you're asking about your child receiving their IEP services, if they're in Duval Homeroom, they're going to receive their services through Duval Home. Okay. The next question is, if a child needs to be quarantined due to the exposure in a classroom outside of their main class, for instance, in a gifted or in speech therapy, how do they receive academics during their 14 year, uh, sorry, days, not years, sorry, 14 days out? Mm -hmm. Regular class do, does not quarantine, but they do. Um, if this is a situation where it's just the student themselves being quarantined uh, outside of the class and the, the class is not impacted, um, they it will be no different as if they came down with the measles. They would get their makeup work as normal. Um, speech is a little different in that um, the speech therapist if they are receiving their services in a one-on-one -on -one setting, that may be done through Duval Homeroom. Um, or if they're in a small group, again, if they were normally out of school for illness, they would receive their makeup work the same way. Oh, okay. The next question is, are students eating breakfast and lunch in the classrooms? Um, some students will eat breakfast uh, in the classroom. Uh, most of our students already eat breakfast in the classroom. Uh, and 
as it relates to lunch, some students will be eating in their classroom and other students will be eating in the, in the cafeteria. Every school has created their own plan on how they will uh, handle breakfast and lunch. Again, with the, um, the standards of the, it must be six feet social distancing between students. Um, some of our smaller schools, they can actually do that in their cafeteria and not have any problems, but some of our larger schools, they have to do a combination. Again, we've made it very open for schools. Some schools will be using outdoor space, but again, they have to have a plan B. What if it's raining and the weather is not um, behaving the way we would want it to for students to be outside? They have to also have uh, an indoor plan for uh, breakfast and lunch, but currently many of our elementary schools do eat breakfast in the classroom. Oh, okay. Next question. Do schools currently have laptops available in brick and mortar so that they can become comfortable with the Microsoft Teams and other online resources so that they will be prepared in case the outbreak happens and they have to shift to the dual home room? Well, currently um, our laptop will be about a one to four, uh, one laptop for every four. We do not have a one to one laptop in um, initiative at this time. We just brought to the board uh, a proposal of a one-to-one -one initiative for our secondary students, and that will continue for this upcoming school year. It will be probably another couple of years before we can move that down to the elementary, but as students are in brick and mortar, they will utilize the technology that is available to them, utilizing the program that many of those programs are the same ones that would be used on uh, Microsoft Teams. We are training all of our teachers on Duval Homeroom and the utilization of Microsoft Teams and the other online resources so that uh, if we have to transition a classroom or a school, it, it, it will be uh, easier than hopefully than when we made the transition in the spring. Mm -hmm. That's correct. After 9.14, what will be the class size as far as meeting the social distancing protocol? Again, the we, we must meet the class size. Um, well, it is the state class size. Uh, uh, our social distancing, again, the protocol is when we cannot have six feet apart, then students must be wearing a face mask or a face shield. Um, and, and that is our uh, standard for uh, students being on the bus as well as in the classroom. When we say after 914, I'm assuming you mean when, if, we are going back to five days a week and students uh, being in class. It still does not take away that families can continue on Duval homeroom, even if we're going back five days a week. Our main concern is not about being in class. Our main concern is when they have to move from class to class. Um, you know, when you're in class, the, the you're averaging between 25 to some of our larger classes, which are our electives. That is something we're working on, on how we can reduce those class sizes. But the number one concern is when students move, when our high school students move about campus, and when they go to lunch, even when we have all of these other spaces that we are opening up for lunch it is very different when you have uh, a thousand students on a high school campus versus 3,000. And that is that continues to be our, I won't say it's it's in the top one or two concerns we have when we open up for brick and mortar. Oh, okay. Uh, the next question is if each school capable to do COVID test, or is each school capable to do COVID test? If yes, based on what criteria they will do the testing and who will pay for the um, 
Currently, the rapid testing is only for employees, and we are uh, hiring a, a rapid response team of nurses. So it will be those nurses who will do the COVID test, and our health insurance is paying for those tests to be um, completed by an, an, another company. So that that this program is for employees. Okay. Now I have another question. If a teacher has symptoms and wants to get tested, is the teacher supposed to get a sub while waiting for the results? The next part of the question is, are the students expected to stay home waiting for the teacher results? And what is the protocol for the teachers getting tested if they feel they have any of the many COVID symptoms? Well, first and foremost, our teachers have a medical assessment app that they need to complete every morning. Uh, that app asks them questions such as, uh, has someone in your household tested positive for COVID? Uh, do you have any of the following symptoms? So if they answer uh, a yes to any of those questions, it, it sort of tells them what, what they need to do. Um, for our rapid testing, we, we will have a form for our employees that tells them if you meet this criteria, you qualify for rapid testing and you need to do ABC, it tells them what they need to do. Um, anything impacting students must be based on a confirmed positive test. So if we don't have anything confirming that anyone is positive, a teacher would take a sick day like anyone else. If they had the common cold, they would probably take a sick day and uh, call in for a sub and the sub would come and the, our substitutes are required to wear facial coverings and all of the same protective uh, PPE that we have for teachers, our substitutes are required to do the same thing. Next question, what about after school programs and extended day in elementary schools? Are they still available? Yes, all of our after school programs and extended day will be available. Those programs will be required to follow the protocols that we have very similar to being in school with facial coverings, frequent hand washing, the social distancing, but they are available. I believe extended day is open at this time for registration and it is online and uh, it's important that you go in and, and sign up. Okay, the next question I have, I think so, even if it might have been answered, but this was asked by one of the parents. Can you just give a brief difference between dual homeroom and the virtual? Like, just what yeah. basic here. Yeah. Okay, dual homeroom is online instruction uh, delivered from a teacher following the same schedule as if in brick and mortar. And the student is just taking that instruction virtually from home. Uh, Duval Homeroom is also, uh, students can opt out. We ask that they commit for the nine weeks. So at the end of each nine weeks, students can opt out to come back to brick and mortar. Uh, DVIA is an actual virtual school. Those students that uh, attend DVIA actually are drawing from their school of enrollment. Duval Homeroom, they stay in their school of enrollment. And students are um, making the commitment to be in DVIA the entire school year or until they complete their courses. So high school, you can complete at different times during the school year, but for elementary students, to complete uh, DVIA, they have to be in DVIA the entire school year. So oh, okay. that's the major differences between the two is that um, you actually withdraw and enroll in DVIA. And just as a, a reminder, the board approved the waiver of, of magnet seats. So if you were a student at James Weldon Johnson and your child has maybe has some 
medical, underlying medical issues, so you believe they need to be out for the entire school year, you may have enrolled in DVIA, but your seat is still saved at James Weldon Johnson. That makes sense, okay. The next question is, what if there are no available subs? Will classes be still be split between the teachers? That right now is um, one of our issues that we are working through. Uh, what happens if we cannot get a substitute? And at this time, each school has worked out a plan to support our teachers to ensure that we're not overloading classes. Um, but when we look at our numbers from Duval Homeroom versus our classrooms, we, we feel like each school will be able to uh, put in a plan that, that will be one that we support the students who are there and that we're also supporting the teachers. Oh, okay. Another question that I have from one of the parents is, if the student is in the dual homeroom, do they, do they get the same teachers as of their school? Like suppose they are in some XYZ public school, and now they are dual homeroom. Will they get the teachers of the same school or it can be from any school who's going to teach them? Um, right now, for most of our schools, they are getting teachers from their school. Okay. Uh, but here is the, the difference. At the end of the nine weeks, if a parent says, well, I think I want to now send my children back to brick and mortar, especially at elementary, they need to remember that teacher is still teaching Duval homeroom. That they they will they they do they have a teacher from the school, but it doesn't mean that that's going to be your teacher when you return, unless a large number of students are returning back, and therefore that teacher would return back. But for most families, they are getting instruction from the teachers at their school of enrollment. For some of our small schools or schools that had minimal amount of students sign up for Duval Homeroom, we, we sort of partner schools. So I might have two schools that are working together to support the number of students in Duval Homeroom. But uh, in many instances, this, we had enough students enroll in Duval Homeroom that we could stick with the teachers that are currently uh, working at that school. Oh, okay. Now I have another question. It's a little bit like it is related to this, but just not quite related. If a child has cleared, like there are two levels of the gifted, child has cleared the first level and the parents are waiting for the second level. How soon will that level to be conducted? Because I guess that is done by this uh, county psychologist. And if the student clears, then will that student be placed in the gifted class during this session? We are following all of our protocols. Uh, I okay. believe we have a 60 day turnaround that we must meet. And if they're in that process, that process has continued. And if oh. they qualify for a certain gifted program and that's what we're offering, then they will be enrolled in that program. Oh, okay. I think so. The parent has not got the response after those child completed the first. So, and will the second level be done face to face or is it getting done online? Well, that would have to depend on whether that family signed up for Duval Home Room or if okay. they're attending brick and mortar, it will be face to face. If they're in Duval Home Room, then those services, they will have to schedule how those services will be offered. Oh, okay. Uh, that's all from our side and from all the parents. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'll go back to Amuda. Trust me, they were like, I don't think so. There was any question which was not answered. At least I'm very much satisfied and I'm sure parents are. So thank you so much. But I'll give you back. Thank you so much, Dr. Diane Green, uh, for answering majority of the questions, actually most all the questions from the parents and the teachers and addressing the questions and kids' safety and many other uh, topics that the parents and teachers had. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. I would also thank Richa for moderating this very well. Thank you, Richa. I hope you know, everyone who's, yeah. I told you my son said she's a super one woman. I had to prove <laughs> I can do something, right? So I prepared myself. <laughs> but 
trust me when i this was a very small thing he well he is very good in making stories but i said him i'm having a live seminar with her so might be after 7 o'clock you will see some super women qualities in me and trust me he made such a bad face he's like oh hell no i said okay, just forget it <laughs> you can never be like her i say i'm okay with that i trust me <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, well, he just he just hasn't seen it yet. Give him some time. He will see the greatness in his mother. Oh, Dr. Green, I don't think so you remember. He, you asked him one time and you said to him, "Oh, your mom is very sweet." Do you remember his answer? And he was like so loud, "No." <laughs> I cannot forget you that instant that. answer. So, and he was very instant. He's like, "No, she's not." Right? <laughs> just fine. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, everyone. And I would just, uh, we would like to wait for Tia, but Dr. Green, if you have some other commitment and you want to leave, that will be fine. But we thank will you. wait because she said she'll join around quarter to seven. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. Thank, thank you so, so much, much Dr. Green. Green. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the parents who are still there, I wanted to let you know that we have Tia Leathers who will be a uh, liaison to the families and community members. She will be taking all the additional unanswered questions and she will return the answers to the Indo-US Chamber at later date. And we will submit them or like we'll post them somewhere as FAQs so that it is visible to all the parents. Uh, Tia Leathers is an executive director of the Family and Community Engagement. It is a department of dual county public schools. She provides oversight to community education, driver education, extended day, volunteer services, the 5,000 role models of excellence project, the district's parent academy, faith-based business, nonprofit partnerships, and organizes United Way campaign for the district's more than 12,000 employees. She joined DCPS in 2013 to directly lead the Parent Academy, a free family resource providing support for the student achievement, parenting advocacy, and personal growth. Since its inception, the program has reached over 50,000 parents Sorry, to date. 
While in this role, she hosted the inaugural Parent Academy Conference in Jacksonville, helping seven additional counties successfully implement parent academies across the state of Florida. Leathers has spent the last 19 years in management, which includes five years uh, with the Youth Foundation as an assistant manager, program manager, and program director. She also worked seven years for the Junior Achievement of North Florida, beginning as the manager of Northside Downtown Schools and ending as vice president of programs for the 20 county organization. A Jacksonville native and graduate of William M. Raines High School, Leathers has a passion of education and the community. She is an ex officio member of the Jacksonville Public Library Board of Trustees, is a board member of Educating Minorities About Transplants, is the program chair for the Bold City Chapter of the Lynx, Incorporated is a Junior Achievement Volunteer, a member of United Way's Atlantic Circle, Elpa Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, and a proud graduate of Leadership Jacksonville, the class of 2017. She received a full academic scholarship to attend the University of North Florida, where she received her bachelor's degree in communication. She has since earned her master's of business administration degree, completed a developing manager effectiveness program at the Pennsylvania State University, a strategic framework for nonprofit organization program at Howard University, and has a national certification in cultural intelligence and unconsciousness bias from the Cultural Intelligence Center. She is a lifelong member of St. Stephen AME Church, where she serves as a steward and a member of the Scholastic Achievement Committee. Leathers is married to her husband of 13 years, and they enjoy spending time together with their old year, eight year, sorry, old daughter. So she will be with us shortly. If anyone has any questions, they can just uh, email us or they can again just put it in the chat. We will take your questions and I think so it will take a week or so, but how soon it can be replied when she comes, she will let you know. So I would request everyone to just kindly go ahead with the questions.
Hey Tia, how are you? I'm good. Can you see me? No, and I really want to see you. Let's see. It says start cam and stop. When I say start cam, this is what it gets, huh? Let's see. Oh. Uh, I think so, Tia, there might be some issues in the camera. Mm -hmm. I was just on a Zoom and um, my camera was on. I don't know if there's something I need to tell my computer about StreamYard so that mm -hmm. it would show. But what's happening now? So Dr. Green's piece is over and is there- Yes, Dr. Talking? Green is over and we are live, so uh we had the questions but there are some parents obviously they typed in our comments and i guess there are around 10 to 12 questions okay. so how should we send you the questions so that the parents know that this is what the us is doing it looks like i can copy them if i start at um how will fsas be administered this year is that where you would say the final question was it seems like dr green was up there um from yes. the earlier parts. Okay, so I'll copy that part. Um, will there be a, a recording? I guess you all can answer that. Uh, uh, no, right now we are not taking any questions on the Facebook because we wanted to send you as an FAQs. So okay. how do you want us to send you the questions? I just want like parents should know that this is how Indos US is going to send you the questions. Right, um, so if you email them to me, um, mm -hmm. Then I'll get them answered. For now, I have the FSA question and the Duval Homeroom teachers. If they've gotten the opportunity for any special training to engage and deliver the courses remotely, I can okay. do those too. If there are any additional ones, then just email them to me and I'll get them answered and send them back to whoever sends me the question. Oh, okay. Yes. I have received some of the questions on my text messages. As they said, they I, I think so. They might have written before. But by that time, Dr. Green's time was like, because we obviously requested it for an hour. Got it. So they have texted me those questions and we will email it to you. Okay. And uh, do you have any idea how much time will it take to get back to those? Like the parents will know the answers. Just a rough idea. You know, um, if today's Wednesday, I think by the end of the week, even if I have to call somebody and just ask it um, over oh. the phone. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is great. Uh, then I okay because I also said you will get the answers within a week, so I'm fine. Good yeah, to go. you're good. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's perfect. Fine. And actually, okay. it didn't paste well for me. So if you could capture that, how will FSAs be administered? Question, and then whether or not the teachers have gotten trained on how to do the remote stuff. You know, I, I'm sure they mean like, can it be more interactive, and are they getting special training for Duval Homeroom? But um, okay. it didn't paste well, so I'll need that one. Okay, I will, what I will do is I'll email you all the questions and once it, I get the reply or like obviously the Indo US gets the reply, we okay. will get back to the parents and we will post it. In I don't our know why you can't see me. I'm gonna open yes. my laptop and see. Oh, yes, no. now I can see you. Isn't that crazy? Yes, well, because that's electronics. Because I have my keyboard underneath it so I can't exactly <laughs> do it this way. Yes. I'm like holding, oh, and then it went away again. Yes, I think so. You know, in your area, Dr. Green also said there were like thunderstorms. So yeah, it's lightning yeah, and everything. I had some issues, yes, for a few minutes. Yes. Okay. Well, I, I have long yes, hair I'm like you. Like... It's not straight. <laughs> <laughs>
So you're back to the office, right? Well, I was here today, but I do have ADA forms for my doctor. So I'm going to oh, okay. forward them. You are live. Me. I'm just letting you know we are live. Okay? No, we're not. Yes, we are. Not right now. Yes, we are. Know. Well, hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we thought we were backstage, but I'm glad that now we're live. Well, hello, hello. <laughs> All right. Amuda, do you want to join us? And let's say thank you to Tia, and she has told us how will she answer our questions. Uh, Tia, Amuda, uh, Amuda is the president of the Indo-US this session. Hi, Hi Tia. How, how are you doing? doing? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? Thank you for joining us. Thank of you. Of course, anytime. <laughs> thank you so for having us. We have a few more so questions on. in the chat. So what we can do is we can provide those questions to you. Uh, so that uh, we can uh, get the response back and send it to our community uh, people who have asked the question absolutely yes. we'll be sure to get those answers. thank you so much for your time and it's my pleasure yeah. thank you for hosting the forum yeah thank you so much yeah okay. thanks okay thank you okay Great.